In this tutorial, we'll talk about how lactic acid is produced and under what conditions large quantities of lactic acid are made in the body resulting in lactic acidosis. I'm assuming that you're familiar with glycolysis, with the TCA or Krebs cycle, and the respiratory chain, and we'll only discuss those as they relate to lactic acid production. So what you can see so far on the screen is a simplified version of glycolysis where one molecule of 6-carbon glucose is converted to two molecules of the 3-carbon pyruvate. There's a net production of 2 ATP in this pathway and reduction of NAD to NADH. And of course, when we say reduction, we're talking about the chemical reduction of transfer of electrons and hydrogens away from carbons and glucose to NAD to make NADH. And you can see that pyruvate, the carbons in pyruvate, are more oxidized than those in glucose. So the production of these NADH and the requirement that they somehow get reoxidized to NAD plus is at the heart of lactic acid production. And we'll get back to that in a, just a few moments. Okay, so let's look first at what happens under conditions where not much lactic acid is released from cells, but instead the pyruvate enter the mitochondria and full carbon oxidation occurs. So these are under conditions where there is plenty of molecular oxygen and fully functioning mitochondria. Pyruvate, under these conditions, enters through the pyruvate transporter, is oxidatively decarboxylated by this amazing enzyme, pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is highly regulated, and one carbon dioxide comes off of each pyruvate, and an acetyl-CoA is the result. Of, from each pyruvate. So the two carbons on an acetyl-CoA combine with a four-carbon molecule in the TCA cycle to make six-carbon citrate, two CO2 are produced in the pathway and released, and there's four steps of carbon oxidation. In those carbon oxidation steps, electrons are transferred to three molecules of NAD and a molecule of FAD resulting in three NADH and one FADH2 produced. These uh, cofactors are reoxidized in the respiratory chain, the NADH at complex one of the respiratory chain, the FADH2 is reoxidized at complex two, and in the process the electrons from these oxidations are transported down the electron transport chain to the various complexes and ultimately to molecular oxygen. Most of the oxygen we breathe is used right here in complex four, and the oxygen is reduced to water. Okay. And during this process, you'll recall that protons are pumped through these protein complexes, increasing the proton gradient here, and it's the energy of the proton gradient that drives ATP synthase to create ATP. So this, of course, is, is a summary of what happens when glucose is fully oxidized uh, through mitochondrial respiration. And if you recall, I started out by saying that it's very important how this NADH gets reoxidized. The NADH that was formed in the cytoplasm from glycolysis, how it gets reoxidized to NAD+. So let's look at that next. Please turn to the next slide. So under conditions where there's plenty of oxygen, mitochondria are healthy, most of these NADH that were produced out in the cytosol are reoxidized back to NAD plus by transferring their electrons through some electron shuttles. There's various shuttling systems in mitochondria. We're not going to get into the details. It's not really essential here. But suffice it to say that those electrons are transferred into the mitochondrial matrix to NAD or FAD, reducing those um, um, cofactors to NADH or FADH2, which can then be reoxidized in the respiratory chain. Okay, and the result is that regeneration of NAD plus out in the cytosol, which can be used for more rounds of glycolysis. Please turn to the next slide to continue. So what happens when there is insufficient respiratory chain activity? If either the oxygen concentration is low or in cells like red blood cells that have no mitochondria, uh, or something that inhibits the respiratory chain activity. 
Okay, what happens under those conditions? Well, the NADH in the mitochondria build up, levels of NADH build up. The NADH cannot be fully reoxidized at complex one if there's not enough oxygen to be the final electron acceptor, or if for whatever reason, we'll talk about some of these in a moment, the respiratory chain itself is inhibited. Okay, so when NADH builds up, the TCA cycle is inhibited. So we have a decrease in activity of the TCA cycle. Pyruvate dehydrogenase, this enzyme involved in producing the acetyl-CoA, is also inhibited by elevated NADH levels, so its activity drops. Pyruvate remains out in the cytosol. The NADH that was produced from glycolysis in the cytosol is, will be unable to transfer its electrons into the mitochondrial matrix because, of course, under these conditions, the NAD plus levels in the matrix are low and NADH has already built up. So this process of the electron shuttling will be greatly inhibited. On the next slide, we'll see what does happen with the cytosolic NADH. In the absence of sufficient respiratory capacity, the cytosolic enzyme lactate dehydrogenase comes to the rescue by using the transiently elevated cytosolic NADH and the pyruvate that was formed from glycolysis and transferring the electrons and the, the hydrogens from the NADH to the pyruvate to regenerate the cytosolic NAD+, which is required for glycolysis to continue, and resulting in lactate production. Okay, so what happens with this lactate? Well, it is shuttled out of cells. When it starts building up in shell cells, it is shuttled out of cells through a transporter, so we'll draw a transporter here, along with a proton. So the result is that there is an increase in acid, we'll call it lactic acid, that is released outside of cells. Okay. So in the next slide, we'll talk about uh, what happens with this lactic acid. On the previous slide, we saw that cells with insufficient respiratory capacity release lactate, eventually to go out into the blood. Cells that do have sufficient respiratory capacity take up that lactate and a proton and utilize that lactate. So again, lactate dehydrogenase, the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase, is essential here. It, of course, like all enzymes, works in both directions. It can take the reduced lactate and transfer electrons from it to NAD+, to make NADH, resulting in pyruvate. That pyruvate can enter the mitochondria and go through the TCA cycle and produce more ATP in those cells. Okay? In hepatocytes, that lactate can be or yeah, that lactate can be taken up, converted to pyruvate again and be utilized to make glucose in the process of gluconeogenesis. This is really important during exercise in which uh, skeletal muscle produces lactate, releases it into the blood. Hepatocytes take it up, shuttle it to pyruvate, and make glucose. The glucose then gets released, and the muscle can use more glucose. Okay, And this NADH, again, that was produced can be reoxidized down in these electron shuttles, assuming that there's plenty of oxygen and sufficient respiratory capacity. Now, on the next slide, we'll talk about when lactic acid builds up, causing lactic acidosis. So we've seen that it's the normal state of affairs in the body for some cells to be producing lactate, release it into the blood, and other cells to take up that lactate to utilize it. Okay, This is constantly happening. Our red blood cells are always making lactate. Some of our muscle cells produce lactate and release it into the blood, skin cells, etc. So what's the difference between this normal production of lactate and the pathologic state of lactic acidosis? That has to do with the quantity of lactate that's produced and the inability of the body to take up that lactate and reoxidize it effectively to pyruvate. So it ultimately comes down, once again, to this ratio of NADH to NAD plus in the overall body. Okay? And recall that 
NADH in order to be reoxidized to NAD+, ultimately gives its electrons and, and hydrogen to oxygen in the respiratory chain. So anything that affects oxygen delivery, inhibits oxygen delivery, or inhibits mitochondria in general, can result in an elevated NADH to NAD plus ratio, resulting in lactic acidosis. All right, so specifically, what are some of these? Well, inhibiting oxygen delivery. Okay, this could be caused by problems uh, in the whole in the circulatory system. Okay, so circulation, circulation problems. It could be caused by hypoxia, so just insufficient oxygen. It could be caused by um, bleeding, you know, anything that, that prevents oxygen delivery. It could be caused by carbon monoxide poisoning that inhibits the ability of hemoglobin to bind and release oxygen effectively. It could be caused by uh, inhibitors of the respiratory chain, such as cyanide. Cyanide binds at complex 4 and inhibits oxygen from accepting electrons and being reduced to water. Okay. It could also be caused by mutations in mitochondrial DNA. Recall that all of the genes encoded on the mitochondrial DNA encode proteins of the electron transport chain in ATP synthase. So there are people who have mutations in mitochondrial DNA that end up with chronic lactic acidosis. Okay. Excessive ethanol consumption, alcohol consumption, can result in lactic acidosis. And we're not going to get into the details of that here, but you'll recall that ethanol oxidation results in lots of NADH production, shifting the ratio of NADH to NAD plus in the liver, and if there's sufficient ethanol consumption, that can actually result in lactic acidosis. So the bottom line of all this is that lactate production, excessive lactate production and lactic acidosis is the result of abnormally high NADH to NAD plus ratios in the body.